Good morning from Essex. Specifically, this is the Tendring district of Essex, right up in the northeasternmost point of the county. If you go any further that way, you'll hit Rotterdam, which is 150 miles away in the Netherlands. And if you go an hour and a half that way, you'll hit London. This district is famous for having one of the most infamous witch hunters who's ever lived in the UK about 400 years ago and it's also famous for having the single or one of the single most important towns in the USA's history. First stop we're heading to the coast about five miles that way but this is the start of two days in northeast Essex. Everywhere we go we'll put a link in the written description so you can find it easily. I'm excited. The weather's glorious today. I just hope it holds out for tomorrow because it's looking a little bit I do today. That was Walton on the Naze with beautiful white sandy beaches. I got overexcited and I was resting my hands and gloves in a huge amount of seagull poo for about five minutes and I just looked up covered in seagull poo. So they're not going anywhere today. I don't know if the camera is disgusting and I stink now. I don't know if it will pick it up. All around us here, this is the North Sea and our first proper point for today, Naze Tower. 300 year old naval lookout point. Let's go inside. I think we may be able to get up to the very top. Let's roll. I'll leave my gloves there so if someone does want to steal them, they're more than welcome to them. <laughs> inside the Nays Tower now. I think we're on floor six of eight. It was built 300 years ago. It was used during the Napoleonic Wars, World War I, World War II, Cold War, all throughout history up until about 19, 1960s, early 1970s, something like that, fell into a huge state of disrepair. And in 2004, it was completely redone, repointed, and brought back to life and it's privately owned. So it's a mixture of a coffee shop downstairs, art galleries on a few higher stairs or a few higher levels and two floors up, there should be a stunning view. And this is the only one of its kind in the whole of the country. And it's one of only two navigation, naval navigation towers in the UK. You may say, yeah, but Freddie, it's a lighthouse. 
it's not a lighthouse. There was never a light. It's purely a navigational tower. And I think during World War II and the Cold War, there was also a huge radar on the very top of it. Let's go and see what the view's like. What a day we've caught it on. Oh, Monica's <laughs> phone nearly fallen downstairs there. What a day we've caught it on. Oh, wow. North Sea all around us. Wow. I've got a fun fact. Have a look around the coastline, Monica, all around there. Because when this was built in 1720, it was a quarter of a mile away from the sea. A quarter of a mile. Now, 300 years on, it's just 50 meters away from the sea. So this railing here is about 50 meters away. Mm -hmm. They've had to do a lot, a lot of work to be able to protect this and stop the sea just eroding everything. And you can see there all of the barriers to protect this specific area. What you can also see, I think they are, I think the World War I pillar boxes. So these pillar boxes here in the sea were used to help defend the coast. And this shows how much erosion there's been because these would have been on land like the tower was. And then are properly in the sea. These are not World War I. I was informed by Emma at the Nays Tower. These are World War II pillboxes. And it is incredible to think that these were the same height as this, the Nays Tower. It just shows you the extent of the erosion. And if they didn't have these protectors here, the Nays Tower would be gone. Shark teeth, fossiled, sh fossilized shark teeth, 30 to 50 million years ago. Apparently it's a hotbed here for fossils. You can just on a daily basis, dig your hand into the side of the cliffs and find different fossils. Really? Incredible. Yeah, it's meant to be well known for it. Mm. Right, should we see if we can get in the pillbox? Uh, not sure, no. Good answer, follow me. <laughs> be careful. Oh. It's incredible how well built these are. It's fallen all this way into the sea mm -hmm. and it's still in one piece. Near enough. Hey, Fred. Freddy. Get out of there. Right, let me show you inside a World War II pillbox. sand's getting compared to the window, but this would have been the lookout point for the World War II soldiers. And the only light from these tiny slits all the way around. talking to the owner of the Nays Tower and this is all part of the same business the Nays Tower cafe where we're eating now and the Nays Tower and they said it was a real community effort to actually save this building because it was incredibly close to just being washed away into the sea finally they managed to save it but it took a huge amount of time going all the way up to the highest level in Parliament to actually manage to save it this this is where we are right now 1928 Everything here used to be a thriving golf course until the British government had to take it over for the World War II effort. But if it weren't for that, and the erosion as well, this would still be a golf course. Oh, it's a lovely spot here for bikers because you park up here, 
50 meters away is the coffee spot there. Go up the tower with a great view of the sea all around. And it's tucked away in a little corner of Essex that we probably wouldn't even have known about. Monica, you ready to hit the road? Yes, I am. Let's go. Welcome to an ex-cow shed and an ex-gym. Now it's the home of the East Coast Distillery. This is a gin company that started just four years ago and they only made their first batch of gin two years ago. Monica, I'll take the camera off you and I'll show you around. Two years ago, probably wasn't much here at all. So this is open on Fridays and Saturdays for, well, Saturdays for gin tasting and tours and Fridays you can come in here come to the bar buy some of the local produce or specifically the local gin and a few other bits and pieces this is the signature gin up here Tides Fortune I can see we've got a little setup here and it's okay I'm biking but I can just have a little taste we'll do a bit of gin tasting after that you can see all of the different flavors and accompaniments here. These, everything that goes into the gin, they're local produce. These are locally picked botanicals. Over here is the still, and this is where the gin in essence is made. This is the core of all of the gin producing. All of the ethanol, 96% ethanol, all of that goes into here. All comes up to the top there, right up to the action man at the top, and then it comes out of the bottom here. And if you're wondering how long it takes to bottle all of these bottles of gin, one person this was, that's what four and a half hours work looks like. It's just two couples who own this business. We've got Simon and Nicole. So this is Nicole here working away. And it's just a team of four who do absolutely everything in here. Once the gin's all finished being bottled, it goes into the boxes and is sent off to a range of different pubs, restaurants, and different shops in the local area. But the key is, everything here is local. So even the botanicals here, these all genuinely, the majority of these hand-picked locally, a lot of them close to the coast. So it's just about, as local as you could possibly imagine. That was the first tasting I've ever done, and it's incredibly fun. I now feel like I am a sophisticated gin <laughs> drinker. We've got a couple of testers or tasters, so we'll be having those in the cabin this evening. But East Coast Distillery, come down. Saturday, they do tours and tastings. Friday, the shop's open, and it's an amazing Christmas or birthday present because it's, it's all proper locally distilled and bottled, everything done right here, everything. There isn't a factory about 10 minutes away or anything like that. So highly recommended. Time to hit the road. 
Well, we didn't end up doing a ride to get here at all because it's right behind the East Coast Gin Distillers and I really hope I'm in the right place because the place I'm looking for is almost impossible to find on Google. I spent one hour yesterday trying to find this place. The only way I managed to find this is by finding a house that sold here a few years ago and I managed to get the postcode. If you're local to the area, you know about it. If you're not local, you'll have no idea it existed. This is a hamlet of 15 houses and one closed down pub. Doesn't sound like anything too special, but it's the huge concentration of notable residents who have lived here that makes it so fascinating. Have a listen to this. I'm going to read out just a few of the residents who have lived in this little hamlet. And this is not the entire list because it would take too long. Number one, Sir William Withy Gull. That is Queen Victoria's doctor and one of the prime suspects as the identity of the notorious serial killer Jack the Ripper lived right here. Second one, Virginia Woolf, who is one of the most important 20th century authors. Her brother lived here. Number three, Eduardo Paul Paulizzi, an architect who's considered one of the pioneers of pop art. Number four, Basil Spence, a Scottish architect of Coventry Cathedral. And number five, John Hutton, an artist of Coventry Cathedral, have all lived in this tiny little hamlet. Apparently houses almost never change hands. They get passed down through to the generations. And that is the row of houses behind us. This is a private road here up until this point. So we've had to walk, park the bike, probably close to a mile away in the distance and walk all along this path that meanders around here. But we have, ah, we've made it. These are called the Gull Cottages. Got to be a bit careful here because there are quite a few signs that say private roads. So there's another private road here and it says take the coastal path. So we're on one of the bits you're allowed to walk on. That, the building right in front of us there, that's the old King's Head pub. It closed in 1913 because of a smuggling incident. Very few places I've been like this where it feels completely cut off and perfect. A very, very small, clearly close-knit community. It's a fascinating place, really, really beautiful. And imagine, you know, it, that time living in this little hamlet, knowing that one of the, the residents, possibly your neighbour, is, at least at the time, one of the prime suspects as Jack the Ripper, the serial killer. And that suspect just happened to be Queen Victoria's doctor. <laughs> it's a fascinating place. I mean, it's, it has a very unique feel to it. It's hard to explain, but when you get here, you, you do feel like you're in a kind of hotbed of creativity with all the artists and architects that have been there and, and people who really specifically want to live in a fairly cut off area like this. It's amazing. In the distance, that's Harwich Port. And this gives you a good idea of situation because in the 16th century, this was a smuggler's hotspot. They used to come down here along the estuary and right into the open sea. And you can see how it makes sense. It's very, very well situated right out, I guess, across to Holland, around about 100, 150 miles the other side of the North Sea. And there's an old boat there as well. I don't know if the camera will pick it up. An abandoned boat right on the edge of the water. Can I read something interesting? Yes, yes, please do. This is in regards to William Whitty Gull. That's Queen Victoria's doctor who lived here and the Jack the Ripper suspect. Stephen Knight, in his 1976 book, Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution, claimed that Jack the Ripper, and I'm quoting here, Jack the Ripper was actually a three-man team with Gull, the doctor who lived here, as the actual killer. Knight alleged that Gull was a Freemason and the killings were carried out according to Masonic ritual. Knight claims that Gull afterwards became insane and was certified in an asylum under the name Thomas Mason and a sham funeral service carried out in the pretense that he had died.
feel like I'm in Alabama mm -hmm. with the cornfields. This is our cabin and this is the Malting Farm Cabins. This is a 300 acre farm site that's been run by the same family, the King family, since 19 or the 1920s. They've decided to start diversifying. So we are in the middle here of a 300 acre farm. You've got three cabins here. Prices start at 180 pounds and you can just see over in the distance. Can you make those out? The white tips yeah. of the glamping, glamping. sites. Yeah. You ready? Yes. Stunning, all the exposed wood. Let's go through to the bedroom first. So sleep six, would you say? Sleep six, yep. Sleep so this six, is one, yeah. uh, this is the king bedroom here. And then there's another one through there. But um, look at the window, looking out onto the cornfields. Mm -hmm ceiling just wood everywhere and leading out into or onto a jacuzzi <laughs> and it's all enclosed and private here they also have water sports so you can get paddle boards and stuff at a lagoon just i think about a two minute walk that way bicycle hire everything it's designed to be a secluded retreat so they don't want to make it too big they just want it to be like you've got your own little bit of paradise to explore in your own time. And it is, as Monica said. And this is in our bedroom. Which you can look through. Yeah. yeah. I guess if you have children, that's... Yeah. Hey. And on top as well, you can see. Yeah. Flooring so simple, concrete everywhere, beautiful. Bathroom again. Mm -hmm. with a view out there onto the cornfields with a shower. We can come through this way. I'll come this way. Bedroom for, with enough to sleep for in there. Mm -hmm. And look at this for a living area. Wow. And I have to say one thing, Monica noticed this. This is a freshly <laughs> baked cake. That was so sweet. Yeah, amazing. Oh, it's amazing. Freshly baked cake. They've got everything. Dishwasher, washing machine, good Wi-Fi, because there is not one bar of phone signal here. So if you don't have Wi-Fi, you are not getting in touch with anyone. Beautiful snug area there with mm -hmm. a smart TV. I mean, it's a mixture of Scandinavian style, Alabama inspired. Just your own private little, little area here. And then maybe this is shared, but Everyone has their own table and pit to make a fire in the evening. How would you ever know this existed? I know, Monica, you filmed coming in here, but you actually, you genuinely have to go around the farm to get here. Yes, it took yes. about two minutes of riding just to be able to get here. <sighs> I love it. Happy, Monica? So, so happy. This is my dream. Breathtakingly stunning, this place, isn't it? Really special. Uh, and it's one and a half hours away from London. Mm -hmm. So if you fancy a retreat into the countryside and you're a yeah. Londoner, yeah. this is the place. I think I'll wrap up the day with some of the East Coast Distillery's Pear Gin. Every single place we've been to today is thanks to Visit Essex. So if you're interested in any of the places, go and have a look at the written description below and you can have a look on visitessex.com's website for all the details. Oh my God, a hair. Oh, so sweet. So many hairs here. I've seen five gigantic hairs. Incredible. This is a magical, magical place. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming along. We'll wrap it up there. Thank you to Visit Essex. That hair is running so quickly. 
And it's a bet there. Let's wrap it up and we need to shut the windows. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming <laughs> on. Please do give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, and we will see you all in the next one.